It is Ishtar Sunday morning, 2014. I said Ishtar. Ishtar was the same thing as Easter, which was the goddess of the East in the English countries. In Germany, uh, she was called Ostern, had all these different names in the ancient world for the goddess of the East. We do not celebrate Easter we believe in the resurrection of Christ here. The resurrection was celebrated in the early church for the first 300 years plus, up to 400, uh, began in the 4th century. The resurrection was celebrated every first day of the week because Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week. I've said this before and I'm not going to go into it in great depth, but the, the resurrection being on Sunday or the first day of the week, that is when Jesus was raised from the dead, and Sunday did not take the place of the Sabbath. Sunday is Sunday, and the Sabbath is every day of the week. Sabbath means rest. Rest, that's what it means. Does it mean seventh? If it meant seventh, you'd have a problem because of a lot of the uh, technical aspects of it. Now, where did this Easter come from? It comes from the sun and the tree worship of the ancient world. It is, comes from the same place that the celebration of Christmas comes from. Christmas, these are all the same ho unholy days of the ancient world. Uh, what's called Samhain. And that was what the Roman Catholics, all of this is Roman Catholicism. We don't believe in Roman Catholicism. If I did, I'd be a Roman Catholic. I don't understand why people say, you put down this church. Well, if I believed in your church, I'd be in it. I don't believe in it. Samhain is Halloween or All Hallows Eve. And after Samhain, the next main holiday, they had many of them, but they had four big holidays that moved into the church. The next one was the Feast of Saturn, or the Saturnalia. Saturn, Saturnalia. Saturn was the father of the gods in Rome, and the Feast of Saturn came on December 17th through 24th. And they threw the Yule log in the fire on the 24th, and it sprung out in the form of a tree the next day. And that is what all the female deities of these pagan, this pagan world were. They, were. they were female deities. Whether it was Diana of the Ephesians, or whether it was... Uh, Ishtar, or the grove of Israel. Israel went after the grove. It's all the tree goddess. Oh, I need to put up here with All Hallows' Eve. Now, this is a Roman festival here, Feast of Roman Festival. They celebrated that at Rome. And Samhain, that is a uh, Celtic festival. The Celts settled mostly in England. They settled throughout some of the European continent, but they set up most of their worships in England. In fact, the Druids, this was a Druidic, Druid festival. Now, excuse me. This one up here was a Druid festival. A Druid festival. Now, do the Druids date long before Christ? They've been here a long time. And, of course, Samhain came on October the 31st. That was the end of the harvest. End of harvest. And then you had what was called Mardi Gras. Now this was the festival of the Franks. When we say Franks, we're talking about French. It was the French festival. And of course, if you'll notice, France is a Roman Catholic country and Roman, Rome is a Roman Catholic country. And Ireland where the Druids are most popular in, Eng in the English 
or in the United Kingdom is a Roman Catholic country. And then the Mardi Gras is connected to what was called Easter. Easter was actually the ending of Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras began on February the, the 7th and went through the 14th. And that was a seven-day festival. That answered among the Franks to the festival of the Romans, which went from December the 17th through 24th. Well, the Roman Catholics brought this into the church, brought this Mardi Gras. That word Mardi Gras means Fat Tuesday. Fat Tuesday or Shrove Tuesday. And, of course, uh, gras is the word fat. Marty is Tuesday. This is Fat Tuesday or Shrove Tuesday. And what they did is they, they said their God was going to die on the 15th. And this has a very organized system to it. It was their God, they said, died on the 15th. And they dated that back from, so the 15th would be the death of the sun god among the Franks. And they dated that back from March 25th. March 25th would be 40 days later. And they mourned for their god, Tammuz, who died. And all these gods were supposed to die in the winter. And it had to do with crops. That's what it had to do with had to do with food. That seems to be our problem. Where are we going to eat? Isn't that it? That's the question after you leave church. Where are we going to eat? It has to do with food. And what are we going to eat if times get bad? And some people store up. Jim, do you believe in storing food? Well, if you're a good Christian, you store up a whole lot of food, and nobody else at Grace and Truth has stored up food, and they come to your house and they say, or oh, I need some food. And you're going to say, what are you going to say? Well, I prepared. You you go get your food somewhere else. I prepared for my family. Well, as a Christian, you can't do that. So if you store up food, it's going to last you a day, two, maybe. It's not going to matter if the if everything goes bankrupt and there's no food and we have the greatest recession or depression that we've ever had and we will have that at the end of time. Then you're not going to feed somebody if you have stored up food. That's a waste of time. You understand why? Because you're not going to have it very long. Because most people are not going to store food. Isn't that right? Most people are not. So, Mardi Gras is the... That ends on the 25th. So it goes from... That's a 40-day period. 40-day period. Uh, it, 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 Mardi Gras ends on March 25th. It starts here, here, it ends down here, ends March 25th. So it goes for 40 days. The Roman Catholics brought that into the Roman Catholic Church and called it, what they call it? Lent. So what you do is you give up Brussels sprouts for 40 days, something you really love, and that way you're sacrificing or dying to self. So they call that mourning. But what it was, it was the death of Tammuz in the ancient world. And it went all the way to the 25th. And Tammuz was resurrected from the dead on March the 25th in the ancient world. And it came at the same time every there, year. And the Roman Catholics brought that 15th, the the day of the death of their God after a seven-day festival that went from the 7th through the 14th, and they brought this, this 15th, which was on a Wednesday, since they had a 360-day year, they would set it on the same day every year, and on the 15th, 40 days later, Tammuz would raise from the dead in the pagan world. Well, they, the Catholics brought this Wednesday, and it always came on this day where they started mourning for their God, and they brought that 40-day 
mourning for Tammuz into the church, and they called that day, that 15th, they called that Ash Wednesday. Now, how many people here were Catholics before? Y'all all know about Ash Wednesday, don't you? Everybody knows about that. That's been Catholics. They brought that in the church and called it Lent. Well, March the 25th was the day of announcing the birth of a sun god. How long is the pregnancy last? Nine months later. And what day would that be? Nine months after March the 25th. December 25th. And they brought that all in the church. And all of this is Roman Catholic in origin. And it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. Do we believe that Jesus died for sinners and rose from the dead? Yes, we do. The early church did not celebrate these pagan holidays. Let me just go over here and let's kind of fill this in. I'm going to talk about the resurrection and actually what it is. It is coming to life after dying. We go over here to Ezekiel, the second chapter. Now we find the first, excuse me, I'm going to the wrong chapter, the eighth chapter. Eighth chapter. Now Israel had been involved. Ezekiel is prophesying the demise and the downfall of Israel because Israel had been a nation for 500 years under kings. From Saul, the first king, and then the kingdom splits because Solomon allows his wives to go after the sun and tree goddesses, Baal, which was the same thing as Hercules. That was the sun god in the ancient world whose birthday was the 25th of December. All of this comes out of Roman Catholicism, and America has embraced it. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas or do any Roman Catholic unholy days in early America. All historians know this. I saw that ignorant preacher who's pastor of the Second Baptist, Ed Young, this morning. He said, my major was history in college. Well, let me tell you, Ed Young knows that Christmas and Easter and all of the above are pagan. Anybody who's taken history in college knows that. Every history professor will tell you that. I went into Texas A&M in 1957 in the fall and went into a history class and the professor said, they will not let me tell you the truth about American history. You see, the history teachers know a lot of truth. They know that this is all paganism and Israel split in 1 Kings, the 11th chapter, because Solomon, of all people, wise King Solomon, allowed his 700 wives and 300 concubines to go after sun and tree gods, and God split the nation because of it in northern Israel and southern Judah. And then northern Israel, they kept on worshiping these gods till God destroyed them by the Assyrian Empire in 722 B.C., the thing that people don't know is every reason that Israel was split and scattered throughout the earth. Southern Judah was scattered in 586 B.C. They stayed scattered all over the world for 2,600 years until May 14th. The Jews did, 1948, and then they began to have all of these wars. The war for independence, they had the the Sinai War in the 50, 57 and the Six-Day War in the 60s and, uh, and the Yom Kippur War in the 70s. They had all of these wars because of this right here. Because of all that came into Israel. Because of what America is celebrating this morning on what they call Easter, God destroyed Israel by the millions. Now that ought to be sobering. 
And this is not something I made up. Go online, look up, just Google, Pagan Origins of Holidays. That's all you have to do. Now, it is everything that God destroyed Israel for, and Israel's, Israel's ancestry was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and this was the bloodline from Adam. This was God's covenant bloodline with His people. So He scatters them all over the earth. Then when you get to Acts 2, God pours out of His Spirit on all flesh, red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh. Now the Gentile church is spiritual Israel all because of this right here. Now look over here in the 8th chapter of Ezekiel. This is where you find the first time we find a sunrise service in the Bible. Now if you have a, a, a Bible that's got dates on the side of it, if you've got, got my Bible, the Thompson Chain reference, Right beside it, it'll have the approximate date. I've told you many times that Ezekiel was carried off into Babylon along with there were three deportations, one in 605. This was southern Judah, one in, 580, uh, one in, uh, in, in 597, and one in, six, uh, one in 586. The 586 was the final destruction of Judah, in 597, Ezekiel was carried off with them, and he's over here in Babylon writing these words down, and he says that God has picked me up and carried me in a vision over, back over to Israel that he's destroyed, and he's letting me see these things that Israel is doing. He hasn't destroyed them yet, but he will destroy them in 586, and Ezekiel is seeing these things. If you have... A King James Bible, it'll say 594. That's approximately when he wrote this. 594 B.C. is 594 years. Years. Before the birth of Jesus, of Jesus, and... 594 years before the birth of Christ, add another 33 to that, and you're well over 600 years before the resurrection of Christ. They're having a sunrise service here 630 plus years before Jesus is born. Now, let's read here in verse 12. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Who are the ancients of Israel? The priests, the kings, and this is the leaders of Israel. Their priests and their kings. Their courthouse was the temple. Or the tabernacle, this was their courthouse, table of showbread, seven candlesticks, altar of incense, the veil, the Ark of the Covenant, the uh, brazen sea, and the altar. Six pieces of furniture, these are brass, these are gold here. Now this was, and the priests ministered in and around here and offered sacrifices on this altar and sprinkled the blood of the goat on the Day of Atonement, the 10th. Tenth day of the seventh month, which would be our September, October. Now, what they do in the dark, what he's saying, look what they do in sin. And darkness is always equated, these gods, if you notice, the Celts festival begin at the end of the harvest, October the 21st. That's as the sun begins to dim and goes towards the winter solstice, which is the 21st of December, that's the longest nights of the year. The longest days of the year are June 21st. That's the longest day of the year. The longest night was the 21st of December. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means here in Middle Tennessee that the sun comes up somewhere around 6.30, maybe 7 in the winter at the winter solstice and go, starts setting around 4.30, 4.45. And they thought the sun was moving away from the earth 
and they thought they was going to lose it. So that's why they had these festivals. They had these festivals to celebrate the to offer sacrifices to Saturn in Rome. They offered sacrifices at the Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras and Saturn are the same thing. If you do Christmas, you might as well go down to New Orleans and get involved with all the drunks and the homosexuals and just go out there and party and get wild. It's the same festival in different cultures. Don't believe me. Check and see if what I'm saying is true. Be a good Berean, okay? Check out and see if what I'm saying is true. What's amazing, a lot of people know that Christmas and Easter are pagan, but they don't, they don't know that it's the same thing as Mardi Gras and Halloween. It's just a different culture. It's the same exact worship the gods. The, the Celts started, they thought it would be a good idea at the end of the harvest on the, 20, on the 31st to start celebrating because they knew they had a long, hard, dark winter ahead. They knew they had a long, dark, hard winter. And I know the preachers that go to these big churches don't do this, but I'm tripping all over my, my, uh, my shoestring. I would ask somebody to come here and tie it for me. It's, when you're... When you're my age, it's hard to do this. Ah. Oh, me. Ah. Whew. That's hard to do when you're 74. Whew. All right. Now, this is what Israel was involved in. And they had a long, dark, hard winter. So they started at the, begin at the end of the harvest where there'd be no food. No food until Tammuz was resurrected. And all these gods were representing were crops that would resurrect in the spring. That's all it was about. And Easter comes in the spring. Now let's continue reading. Every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Now remember, Ezekiel is talking to Israel, isn't he? He's not talking to pagans. He's talking to his people. Turn thee again, and thou shalt see greater abominations, the things that stink in my nostrils, that the Israelites do. When it says they do, it's a reference to the Israelites. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. How long did they weep for Tammuz? You're going to have to get this out of secular history. They wept 40 days. Well, I got it here. They wept 40 days, and that's what the Catholics brought in and called Lent. What do you do at Lent? You give up some, something you like for what? 40 days, don't you? And every, Gary's been a Catholic, and Gerald's been a Catholic, and Jane's been a Catholic, and Joel's been a Catholic. We've had ex-Catholics all over the place, and Marianne's been a Catholic. And they've all... They, Everybody that's been a Catholic recognizes all this, don't you? You know what it's about. It's not strange to a Roman Catholic. They know what it is. They wonder, one lady, one fellow that was working here, or come to church here, I don't know if he's working here or not, but when he was coming here, he said he was talking to somebody, it may have been one of y'all, said their, one of their friends from Mexico wished to Merry Christmas one day, when they were working and they said, I'm not a Roman Catholic. And they said, oh, that's right. You're not a Catholic, are you? Even the person from Mexico outside the United States that had not been bent toward our way of thinking understood that if you weren't a Roman Catholic, you knew you wasn't supposed to be celebrating Christmas. Now, this is 600 years here. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house. The Lord's house is 
the is the temple. Now this is after Solomon had built the temple. Here's the brazen sea. And he brought him to the door of the Lord's house, which would be called Solomon's porch. Now there's a gate here that they'd come in, and that was the door of the Lord's house. Huh? I didn't read 15. Okay. Then he said unto me, verse 15, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and you shall see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, somewhere in this neighborhood right here, there's 25 men standing there. The temple faced east. And they, from the, dip, from the house, and behold, at the door of the temple, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty and five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. They're having a sunrise service, worshiping the sun. This has nothing to do with Jesus. Notice, this is 600 years before he's born, about 630 years before his resurrection, isn't it? I'm sorry, that's where it comes from. Well, how can you know that? You're just a little bitty tiny squirt up there with a sports shirt on and a pair of jeans on and some tennis shoes on. How can you know that and Billy Graham know that? Let me assure you, he knows this. Charles Stanley knows this. They don't want to anger their congregation. How many people do you think they'd lose if they said, I've come to realize through my studies that Christmas and Easter is paganism. It's the same thing as Mardi Gras. It's the same thing as Halloween, and we're not going to do it here at our big church anymore. How many people do you think would leave? Oh, about, I mean, John MacArthur, he's got 10,000 on Sunday morning. He might have 50 after he preached and said, I'm quitting doing this stuff. The reason they can't do it is they're building big mega churches. You can't say the truth and have a mega church. You can forget that. So, this is the first sunrise service. And all of this came about, and Israel was involved in this. Was Jesus resurrected from the dead? Well, he certainly he was. That is everything that this is built upon. If you go into the two Babylons, Mr. Hislop will tell you, they did not celebrate the resurrection of Jesus once a year. That comes out of this right here. How in the world, Jim, did they get this March the 25th amalgamated with Easter? Or with, excuse me, with Passover. You see, Jesus resurrected at the Passover. Which comes in April. What they had, the Roman Catholic Church, Roman Catholics, hasn't, didn't anybody ever question, what does Easter eggs have to do with Jesus? What does that have to do with Jesus? You see, eggs are a sign of fertility. Rabbits are a sign of fertility. They multiply at a tremendous rate. Get you a male and female rabbit and you'll have them all over the backyard in just about three months. These were a sign of fertility. All of these were fertility gods. All these gods that had, that had to do with this right here, they were fertility gods. You see, our God is the true fertility God. God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, if you worship me and obey me, he said, your wombs will be full, your children will be healthy, you'll have all the kids you want, you'll go against your enemy one way, they'll flee seven ways. He said, all of this will happen. He said, and I'll give you crops. You'll ha he said, I give the crops, not Tammuz, not Hercules, not Dionysius, not... All of these people, all of these gods of the ancient world that were fertile, every one of them were fertility gods. 
Now, they had a Roman monk. They had a Roman monk to amalgamate the holidays and to redo the calendar. We don't even know what day we're living. Did you know that? We don't know what month we're living in. We don't know what year we're living in. We have to go simply by what we've been given by these chronologists, but we don't know what year we are. We know we're living somewhere between the between 4 to 17, maybe up to 20 to 25 years. We're actually at least four years before where we're living. We're actually, the calendar is dated four years before, so we're actually living somewhere in the neighbor, neighbor of 1800, uh, excuse me, uh, I'll get it right in a minute. We're living somewhere in the neighborhood of 2018 up to maybe 2030. That's where we're living. It's kind of scary if you think of something that I somewhat believe. Jesus was, Jesus was crucified around, we don't know exactly when he's crucified, but we know it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 33 A.D., when the Bible speaks of the last days in Acts, the second chapter, that this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days this would happen. And if a day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, then from 33 A.D. to 2033 A.D. would be two days. Wouldn't it? You reckon he might come somewhere about then? Or maybe, or I don't know. I'm just giving you something to think about. Do I believe we're at the end of time? When I get back on Prophecy Series, yes, sir, I believe it. I certainly believe we're close to the end of all things. This world is getting crazy. I want to tell you one thing that's really bad about America. That's conservative, Bible-believing preachers. They call themselves Bible believers, but they don't believe in predestination, they're not even willing. Do you know they won't even deal with this? They'll say predestination doesn't mean what it says. But they won't even talk about this because this is in all our history, every research history that you can do on the Internet. You can go to libraries. You're going to find this everywhere. They don't even want to talk about Christmas being pagan. They don't want to even discuss Easter uh, with Mardi Gras at all. But it's the same thing. Jim, what are we going to do? Oh, take your cross and die daily and resurrect in Christ daily. And that's the true resurrection. All right. Let me erase this and I'll leave that over there. All right. Tell you what bothers me really bad. You've got preachers in America. You've got the so-called conservatives. These are people like Billy Graham and Charles Stanley and, and uh, Ed Young. They call themselves conservative. When you conserve something, you keep it the way it is, was relig originally presented to you, don't you? That's to conserve. So they call themselves conservatives. And then you've got men that call themselves liberal. Liberal means you want to be at liberty to be at liberty to kind of to, to be able to expand in your beliefs like well I think it's okay for uh, to have uh, homosexual marriages to have gay marriages I think that's okay we need to they have a right in America under the Constitution well the Constitution is not what guides me what guides me is the Word of God now do I care whether Homosexuals marry homosexuals. I don't care. What do you mean you don't care? Babylon is going to do what it wants to do, isn't it? I don't vote for these guys. They, Like I said, they bring out a king cobra and a black mamba and they'll both kill you with one bite. And then they say, one's a Democrat and the other's a Republican. Which one are you going to vote for? None of, none of the above. 
don't believe in voting for those lying thieves. Well, do I believe those guys go to go up there to uh, Washington because they want to serve the people? I believe they go there for power and money. That's what they're there for. You quit paying those guys 200000 a year to be our senators and they won't be there. Now, the liberals say they believe in, in gay marriage. Gay marriage. And they believe in letting people be free, abortion. Woman has a right over her own body. Now, the Bible says over there in Leviticus, the 21st chapter, if two men are wrestling together and there's a pregnant woman close by and they accidentally bump into her, and the fruit depart from her, or the baby departs, if there's an injury to the baby, or if it dies, that person that accidentally got into a scuffle around her has to pay with his life. Now, do you believe if God wants for men to die for accidental abortion, that he's changed his mind today and doesn't mind if you do it intentionally? Don't think so. And I'm not, I'm, my kick is not against liberals. They are what they are. They believe that everybody should live a free lifestyle and they can drink and they can party and they'll get to heaven because they go to church and serve some sort of a Jesus. And then the conservatives say, we as a Baptist in America, we're conservative and we believe in the inerrant Word of God. You are liars. Inerrant word of God. See, I was raised around these people right there. I was raised around conservative Bible believers. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I was telling somebody the other night at the Friday night gathering, I said, I was raised in an independent Baptist preacher's home. <clears throat> they have a way of talking. It's always, well, praise God. Amen, brother. Well, hallelujah. Well, excuse me. They don't say hallelujah. That's Pentecostal. The Pentecostals will say well, amen, yes, uh, hallelujah, brother. And they backslap you, and you just want to kick them, you know. It's just phony. It's fake. I know what they're like. I've been preaching since 1961. I'm not new at this. And I traveled all over America and worked in hundreds of churches. They do not believe in the inerrant word of God. They will not address this right here. They won't address whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. They believe in free will. But if even water baptism, they don't know there's one baptism, one baptism, and it's blood, it's not water. They believe in crackers and grape juice, and Jesus was eating the last Passover and grape juice. And they believe in accept Christ, and you can't accept Christ. And they do all this in the name of religion. And they believe in a sinner's prayer for salvation. And the Bible says, We know that God heareth not sinners. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. And these conservatives believe in the positive message of Jesus. Now, we are none of these. We're not liberal and we're not these kind of conservatives. I am a true conservative conserving the truths of Scripture according to the Greek definition, the culture, the custom, the idioms, the metaphors, the historical content. I'm a true conservative. But there's another segment over here. This is us. This is true believers. True believers. Now, this would be what these guys call the negative. The negative side of believing. Except I call it positive. Daily cross. Death to self. And these guys, if you listen to them on radio, just listen to Bot Radio 1160 on your dial. It's one preacher after another just making everybody feel good. God wants you to feel good about yourself. He wants you to have a good life. And He loves you. And He really wants you to learn to live for Him. And they never say what that means, do they? 
I heard a preacher say on the TV this morning, he said, Jesus rose from the dead for our justification. Can somebody here tell me what that means? Unless you define justification. Hmm? How about the original text, justify, D-I-K-A-I-O-S. No, this would be... D-I-K-A-I-O-O is the word justify. You have to go back to the word justify. It means to render innocent. And the reason we are rendered innocent is because Jesus paid the price for our sin and we don't have to. When He died on the cross, then He resurrected from the grave the third day to show that He was God all over here in the Old Testament. Israel kept going after other gods. He said, just for that, I'm going to pour out of my spirit on the Gentiles or the all flesh, and I'm going to pick me a people out of those Gentiles, and I'm going to come down here. I'm going to put it in your heart to kill me, and watch me stand up on my own. That's resurrection. Proving who he was. He says, I'm God and everybody that believes in me and you won't believe in me unless I put belief in your heart. Because there's none that understandeth and none seeks after God. If nobody seeks God, if God doesn't pick Himself out of family, nobody's coming and that's called predestination. Now, it's these people that bother me more than anything else. These people don't bother me. Liberals don't bother me. They say stuff that's just idiotic and totally against the Bible. We know that. We know that. That, But you say, Jim, don't you believe in joining these guys here and going and sit in against these guys at some abortion clinic and, uh, and, and, and complain about what they're doing and strike against them and sit in, have sit-ins? No, I ain't going to join either one of these people. The world's going to do what it wants to do. Babylon's going to do what it wants to do. Babylon itself, isn't it? Let us make a name is what Babylon was founded on, self. They're going to do what they want, and I'm not interested in what they do. This is the first sunrise service. Is an Easter mentioned in the New Testament one time? Let's go over to the New Testament, Acts 12. I'm not celebrating. What in the world is an Easter egg hunt? Did Jesus have the apostles <laughs> have an Easter egg hunt at the Passover? He came up to Peter and said, "You have any fish?" And he said, "Yeah." He said, "We got it." He gave Jesus a piece of fish, and he, Jesus said, "This is after his resurrection." Has said, "Have you had your Easter egg hunt yet?" <laughs> it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Stupid rabbits in Easter. I could read you something on this. I mean. This is out of the two Babylons. This is out of the two Babylons. I printed this out. Let me read this to you. The consideration of the great festival in the Popish calendar gives the very strongest confirmation to what has now been said. That festival called Lady Day is celebrated in Rome on 25th of March nine months before December the 25th, in alleged commemoration of the miraculous conception of our Lord in the womb of the Virgin, Baloney. On the day when the angel was set to announce to her the distinguished honor that was to be bestowed upon her as the mother of the Messiah, but who could tell when this annunciation was made? Well, the pagans said it was made they on March the 25th. That's what the Catholics brought in the church and called the Annunciation or the announcing of the Messiah nine months later. The Scripture gives no clue <clears throat> at all in regard to the time, but it mattered not. Before our Lord was conceived or born, that very day, now set down in Popish calendar or the Roman Catholic calendar for the Annunciation of the Virgin was observed in pagan Rome in honor of Sybil, C-Y-B-E-L-E, the mother of the Babylonian Messiah. Now it is manifest that Lady Day and Christmas Day stand in intimate relation to one another because they are nine months apart. 
between the 25th of March and the 25th of December, there are exactly nine months. If then the false Messiah was conceived in March and born in December, can anyone for a moment believe that the conception and birth of the true Messiah can have so exactly synchronized and only to the month but to the day, the thing is incredible. Lady Day and Christmas Day then are purely Babylonian. Then Easter. Then look at Easter. <clears throat> what means the term Easter itself? It is not a Christian name. It's absolutely not a Christian name. It, it bothers me to see all these preachers, and we're going to have an Easter special service, an Easter festival, and an Easter egg hunt, and nobody even stops and realizes they're using a pagan thing to refer to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's paganism. Easter is nothing else than Ashtart, the upright goddess that Israel went after, and it was called the Grove. One of the titles of Beltus, the Queen of Heaven. Who is the Queen of Heaven? That's the Mary of Roman Catholicism, isn't it? And Israel was condemned for worshiping the Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah the 44th chapter and in Jeremiah the 7th chapter. And that was 600 years before Jesus. <clears throat> or 700 years. As, whose name was pronounced by the people of Nineveh and was evidently identical with that now in common use in the country. That name as found by Layard in Layard's Nineveh. And I've got Layard's Nineveh. Well, that was published in 1849. 1849, Layard's Nineveh, Mr. Layard went to the Far East, Middle East, did all his archaeological digs and discoveries and came up with all of this. And you can get Layard's Nineveh. It's in print now. It went out of print, but it's in print. I've got an original copy from 1849. That name is found by Layard on the Assyrian monuments is Ishtar. That was the mother of Tammuz. And the reason he had to be resurrected from the dead to give him crops in the spring, they thought when the sap went down in the vines in October, the end of the harvest, and it didn't come up and start, things didn't bloom till spring, till spring in, in March, April, and that's when all of this was the dark months when the sun was at its lowest, then it had to come back up in the spring so crops would begin and go through the summer season. And Israel's seasons of worshiping God began in March, April, began in Nisan, Nisan, and went to September, October. While the crops are blooming, God is saying to Israel, I'll give you all the food you need if you worship me. You go after these gods. I'm going to bring the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and then the beasts will come and carry you away into captivity. We have sword was war. We have that in the world today. Famine is everywhere. We have pestilence and disease. And people say, what's going to happen to America? It's going down. But the world's going to go down. Jesus is going to come and remedy whatever needs to be remedied. I hope you can see these things. It's important. You know that I, people have called me arrogant and smart aleck. When you give people a lot of information that they never heard before, they're going to call you arrogant. And I'm very assertive about what I believe. Mr. Luther said, Martin Luther said in his book on bondage of the will, he said, when a man is assertive, people don't like that. When you're assertive, say, this is, if the Bible's, if you notice, I always preface this, if the Bible's true, this is absolutely true. And I believe the Bible's true. When you say something, be assertive with it. Don't mumble around and well, say, Jesus, God, and predestinate, but don't, I'm not mad at you. Be assertive. Open your mouth and say it with all the power you can. <clears throat> That name, Ishtar, was found in Layard's Nineveh on an Assyrian monument. The worship of Baal and Ashtar, and Israel was involved in Baal, or Baal, was, a very, was very early introduced into Britain with the Druids, with the Celts were. The priest of the groves that Israel went after 
Some have imagined that the Druidical worship was first introduced by the Phoenicians into Israel. I guess so. I guess so. What was Phoenicia? Phoenicia was Lebanon or Tyre and Sidon. Goodness gracious. That's not even brilliant, is it? Egypt. Israel. Israel, Phoenicia. We call it Lebanon. It was called in the days when Israel got involved in it, in the days of Ahab, Ahab met, met Jezebel at some party one night and her father was the prince of Tyre, or Lebanon, or Phoenicia. Married it down into Israel. Northern Israel got involved in it. It was carried away in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. Southern Judah, Babylonians carried them away in 586 B.C. And like I said, they were carried away and kept separated from God for 2,600 years. And that's the truth. Will you like it or not? It's just amazing. I think people think I made this all up. And you know what? If I made this up, I need to be a fix science fiction writer because I'm really good. <laughs> no, right. If I made it up. No, I studied this stuff for fifty over 50 years. You want to learn it? Study it. But if people study, they're going to find out they're in the wrong business. If Billy Graham studied it, I'll guarantee you he's read it. You cannot own a Bible for 75 years and be a preacher for that long and not have heard this. You think he's never ran across Romans 8, 29? You think he's never seen this sunrise service in Ezekiel, the 8th chapter? Do you actually believe that? You see, I give Billy Graham more credit than his followers. They think he's as dumb as he acts, and I don't believe that. I don't believe a grown man that's got an average intelligence will never run across these things that I'm saying in 70 years. I don't believe they can run 25 years and not run, not run across it. I don't believe you can preach for 10 years and not see some of these things. And then he goes into the moon being the queen of heaven and that comes from the first chapter Gosh, I've got so much on Easter here and I don't even have time to read it. I need to get on with my message. I'll set this aside for right now. All right. Let's look over here in the 12th chapter of Acts. This is the only time the word Easter is mentioned in the Bible. And I wonder why they translate it like this. Let's read now in verse 1. Now, about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread, or Passover. Un days of unleavened bread is a term for the feast of Passover. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Well, if Easter's in the Bible, we ought to be celebrating it. That word Easter is the word P-A-S-C-H-A. -A. The Paschal lamb was the Passover lamb. Pascha is the word Passover. Then what's Easter doing in there? You've got to remember, the King James Bible was translated in 1611... 1611, by 53 translators, seven of them left by the time it was released or dismissed in 1611, and half of them were Roman Catholics. There was a lot of compromise translating the King James Bible. This is one of them. That is not the word Easter. It is the word Passover. Now, do with that what you want to do. Now, the resurrection is more than just read Jesus being raised from the dead. The more I study this, 
Y'all have got this down. I'm going to race this up here. In fact, I'll just put it on the board for anybody who hadn't seen this. I had, this is the way I put it on the board. Usually every year. This is the sun, the sun as it wanes, as it turns on its axis, it's going through its path every year. Here's the sun, and as it goes through its path, when the axis is turned toward the sun, then we have, in the northern hemisphere, we have summer, we have winter here. When, because of the earth was turned on its axis, that's why they believe as it moved around in its path around the sun, the pagans thought the sun was moving away because the earth was tilted away from the sun. And so we had winter here. Now, this is the same thing as here you've got the summer solstice. Summer solstice. And the summer solstice on June the 21st. That's the longest nights, nights of the year. I mean, the sun comes up here in Middle Tennessee about 5.30. Doesn't set till nearly 9 o'clock. What did I say? Night. Oh, did I say? Oh, I said nights. The longest days of the year. Thank you. I'm saying a lot. Y'all realize I'm getting my words crisscrossed. All right. This is the longest days of the year, and it comes up Middle Tennessee about sometimes 530 and sets about quarter to nine, nine o'clock. That looks like, boy, we're in for a wonderful time, and that's where we're headed right now. <clears throat> and that's the, that's the time period where the pagan festivals began the pagan festivals began uh, as the sun when you get down here to excuse me this is the end of God's festivals when you get down here to October the 21st well down here September 21st excuse me September 21st Notice these are three months apart. Then you get down here to the... This is the sun waning. When you get down here to September the 21st, the sun gets into position that you've got the... You've got 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. And then you get on down. Then the next day... The days begin to, the night begins to overtake the day, and the dark time begins to come. The dark begins to come, and the sun is waning and getting darker and darker because it's moving towards the winter solstice, which is December 21st, right here, December the 21st. And the Romans had their festival, Saturn, Feast of Saturn, and this is where at the at the uh, spring equinox, a uh, fall equinox, equinox means equal night, equal night, 12 hours a day and 12 hours in the night, on October the 21st is when they quit harvesting, uh, October 31st, so they set up their festival, they say no more crops until next year, till we get to spring of next year. So these were all the dark festivals, dark. And then the Franks, in February, they said since this is 15, on the 15th, they measured backward seven days there. And since the sun is brightening again, and they had all these festivals at Saturn, sacrificing sacrifices to the sun god Saturn, so that his sun would come back, which was the sun. And all of these people said they were sons of the sun god. <clears throat> Then they had this 40-day festival, and then they would get back to the spring 
equinox, which would be 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night, and then the sun would begin to dominate the next day. Well, this is where the dark festivals, these were the pagans' festivals, and then Israel worshipped God in the light till you got back to the till you got back to the dark festivals. They were in the light, and that's why Paul would tell the Ephesian church, You were darkness. Now are you light in the Lord, walk as children of light. That's where it comes from. And that's the truth. What do you want? What do people want from me? I go through states of depression. You wouldn't believe the depression I go through. Sometimes three or four weeks. I just want to sit down and cry. I can't hardly stand it. But I am compelled to preach this message. Yea, woe unto me, woe unto me, Paul said, if I preach not this gospel. I have to keep doing it. I have nowhere to go except straight ahead. You think I can just swallow all of this and forget it and digest it and leave it alone the rest of my life? I can't. I've got more enemies than you can shake a stick at. I've got people writing to me, cussing me, calling me names. People don't want the truth in America. They don't want it about anything. They don't want it about the government. They don't want it about politicians. They don't want it about preachers. They don't want it about anything. They don't even want it about themselves. You remember that thing I put on the board up here? We believe in death to self and daily cross. They don't want to hear you have to be hated by the world to be a follower of Jesus. Isn't that what he said? If the world hated me, it'll hate you. If it persecuted me, it'll persecute you. If you don't take your cross by telling truth to people and being crucified for it because people hate you, you can't be a follower of Christ. You know that puzzles me and I look at these people and I'm thinking, are people in these churches, are they believers? They walk the aisle and they say they accepted Christ when the Bible says you can't accept Christ. They pray the sinner's prayer when the Bible says you can't pray a sinner's prayer and get into heaven when you're dead in your sin. Let me clarify something I said the other night. Do you all think about this? Predestination goes through my mind around the clock. If God didn't predestinate a family, nobody's going to heaven. Well, He didn't just predestinate them to be into heaven. He predestinated them to be like Jesus. Predestination like Jesus is about the same thing that these people call Easter about. It's about the resurrection, isn't it? Because if we're like Jesus... We take our cross daily and we die daily and we resurrect in Christ daily, don't we? I'm, I'm at a place I'm not even mad at anybody anymore. Except I'm only angry at the false teachers. I'm tired. I am so weary. I'm so weary of people coming here and fighting each other and fighting me. Don't listen to gossip. Take gossip with a grain of salt. Because what people usually say is mostly is not true. Haven't you figured that out? People are disgruntled, say things all the time because they don't want to take their cross and die daily. Let me tell you how this thing works about gossip. Gossipers usually leave the church and say, Jim Brown is over there and there's so much gossip going on. They're doing this and that to me. And I'm over here saying, well, let's get back to the lesson. Let me teach on this. When gossipers leave, I'm, I stop the gossip. I say, no more. We can't do it here. They're gossiping. So people are over here with the gossipers say, I'm not coming back over there. There's so much gossip. You're standing there with the gossipers. It's not going to happen here. Not when I know about it. I'll stop it when it starts happening. You have to take your cross and die daily. Now, I want us to go over here to 2 Timothy, the second chapter. What is the resurrection? Every time you find the word resurrection, except for twice, I've been saying once, except for twice, anastasis. Anastasis, it's actually one time because the the other, one of the times it's not translated anastasis is a form of anastasis. Now, I want us to look here in, in uh, 2 Timothy 2. This is what the world is saying 
this morning. Across America with Easter, they're saying the same thing that Hymenaeus and Philetus said. These were two young preachers that were over there working, supposed to have been working in the church with Timothy. Timothy was pastor of the church at Ephesus. That's who Paul wrote First and Second Timothy to. That's that along with Titus are the pastoral epistles. Timothy was pastoring the church at Ephesus. And Titus was pastoring here the church at Crete. Now when he writes to Timothy, he warns Timothy about some false teachers in the church. And they're probably saying, you know, Paul's gossiping about us. I imagine. If somebody tells you that I said something, you better come up and ask me first and find out if I did. Okay? Some I've had people say, you said this. I say, I don't even believe that. <laughs> Why would I say that? I don't even believe it. I used to have people tell me that in real estate. You said this refrigerator stay of the house. I said, I don't never believe in telling people the refrigerator stay of the house. It, I couldn't have said it. I don't even believe it. If you, if you stay with the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. You'll say, that's what I said because this is what I believe. Now, look here. This is what America is saying this morning on Ishtar or Easter Day. This, they're saying the same thing that Hymenaeus and Philetus are saying. And Philetus. These are two young preachers that's preaching a really bad gospel. They said the only resurrection was when was actually when you rose from the dead, when you got saved. We don't believe in get saved. When you came up, when you became a new creation in Christ, they said this is the only resurrection there was. It was one time. Look at verse 16. Oh, well, let's read 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. The word approved is dokimos. It means acceptable. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word rightly dividing means to make a straight cut. It means put the subject here, put the verb here, Put the rest of the predicate over here if it's a direct object or if it's a predicate nominative, it'll have a straight line. Uh, if it's uh, uh, got modifiers, that, that's what it means to uh, rightly divide. Put everything in its proper perspective. Exegete the Scripture correctly. Exegete, that's a big word. It means to pull everything out in its exact context. Look at what's been said, what's going to be said, who's being addressed, what the purpose is. No Scripture is isolated alone. Now, look here. But shun profane and vain babblings. You know what that is? Gossip. Profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker. A gangrenos, a gangrene, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. And here's what they said. They said, Happy Easter. That's what they said. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying, The resurrection is past already. Past is the word genomai. Remember that word, it means to cause to be. It comes from the word gunea, which means born or birth. And we get the word gene from that. Your genes is your makeup, your birth, or when you came into being, to come into being. And genomai, in the Greek text, the New Testament is written in Greek, for those of you that don't know, is called a perfect verb. Being a perfect verb, it means 
the present condition, the present condition is due to a one-time past action. That means that the resurrection was one time in the past, and it's not. This word resurrection here is the word anastasis. Let me erase some of this. This word resurrection is anastasis. And whether people like it or not, it is feminine gender. I deny that Jesus is a female in any respect. I deny that. We are females because we are the church, the wife, the bride of Christ. We're females. When Jesus rose from the dead, His physical body when it resurrected, he, was, he had a physical body when he is here. And his physical body, when it's gone, he left one body here, didn't he? And what's that body? The church. We're the spiritual body of Christ. When he resurrected from the tomb, there was nothing feminine in that. Was there? Not his physical body. He was a male. He was God. He was the Son of Man, not the daughter of man. He was the Son of God, not the daughter of God. Therefore, what they were preaching is whenever you so-called got saved. I walked the aisle one night and I got my saved. I went to the store and I bought some bread and I bought some butter and I bought some sandwich meat and I got some saved too. It's about this long and about that deep. About that wide. You don't get saved. There's no such thing as get. G-I-T. I keep saying that's an old John Wayne word. Now get. That's all it is. Saved is the word sozo. Every time you find it in the Bible. Sozo. It means to be delivered from one point all the way to another point and to be preserved and protected through the fire and the trials. And this is something those so-called conservatives don't want. They don't want the fiery trials. They don't want tribulation. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. That is the narrow way. That is the few that's going in. That's the few that want the truth. Whether people believe it or not, that's what saved is. He has saved us. He is saving us. And we shall be saved. It's not something you get. It's not a one-night resurrection. That's what he's saying right here. It is the resurrection of Christ in His people. There's a couple of verses here I want to give you along with this. I want to show you something in a few verses concerning this. I want you to go over here to Acts, the second chapter. This really looks puzzling. Now, I deny that anything that's connected with Jesus other than His church is feminine. Anastasis is always feminine gender. When you find the word resurrection, you better take another look at the Scriptures because it really confuses the preachers. I have come to believe, and this is really coming to settle in me, that... First of all, Christ lives in time. The, no, excuse me, not time. God lives in eternity. Not time. We live in time. That's limited. Everything, when you study the Word of God, everything is the eternal now with God. They didn't use past tense and future tense verbs in the Hebrew. When they would say something is or am or was or were, all these being verbs, be, is, am, are, was, were, being, been, have, has, had, any form of these words they didn't use in the Hebrew. They didn't say the Lord is God. 
They said, if you said the Lord is God, that is was static language. It was like losing the power. They said the Lord God, since He is, there's only one God, it is the Lord God. Well, He lives in eternity, we live in time. When Paul said over here in Galatians, look in Galatians. Oh, well, I'm going to get to Acts in a minute, but I've got to take you to Galatians first. I'm going to get back to Acts. I've got so many of these things. I believe the church is very confused about the Bible. You know why? They don't study. They don't think tenses of verbs mean anything. They don't think that gender means anything, masculine, and feminine, and neuter. Whenever I say Anastasis is feminine gender, Kittle's New Testament Dictionary of Greek Words, he says that Anastasis can apply to God the Father and Jesus too. Do I disagree with some of the Greek authors? I don't, I don't believe, if you don't really understand the Bible, do I believe I understand it? <sighs> Very little. I don't believe anybody really understands a lot, but I believe these preachers in these pulpits don't understand nothing. They think, even Mr. Kittle says you can apply feminine to God the Father. You remember Orge or G, Ada, or Wrath? And it's the anger and the rage of man. I was looking at Orge and Kittle's last night, and he says Orge, feminine gender, can apply to God's wrath. I'm thinking, Mr. Kittle, what's wrong with you? Now, he was a very brilliant man. It, I'm not going to discount all of his other definition, but I believe he got that wrong. Because in order for Orge to apply to God the Father, he would have to be, have feminine characteristics in him somewhere. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have no feminine characteristics. The feminine part of God the Son is the church, his wife. And I think people have missed this. I think the best scholars, I believe the translators in 1611, when they released this King James Bible, I believe they messed up on a lot of things because they didn't think genders counted. Remember, so I swore in my wrath over there in Hebrews 3 and 6, or 3 and 11. Hebrews 3 11. 3 11. I swore in Tay. Or gay. It says the wrath. And they translated the into a possessive pronoun, my. Implying it was God's wrath. And it was actually the wrath of the people. It was their fury and their rage. I swore in all this rage, you think I brought you out here in the wilderness to die. That you're not going to enter into my rest. He wasn't swearing in his anger. He was swearing in theirs. But the King James Bible translated it like this. They translated it my instead of the wrath of the people. You know, the more I study this, I'm going, oh, wow, oh, me. Whew. And every time you find Anastasis' resurrection, it's feminine gender. It can't possibly be the wrath of Jehovah God. It can't be possibly the resurrection of Jesus and this orge cannot be God's personal wrath, but he says he takes this wrath and places it upon men. That's why they don't want to translate that correctly. If they say the orge, which is your rage and your fury, when you get mad because somebody does something to you, if they say, if they translate it that right and say that God put that on man, that means God's sovereign even, oh, even over your fury. That the only reason you get mad in traffic is because God wants you to that day until you learn not to do that. That's, that's, why they don't, that's why they missed a lot of the translations correct. You know, you think you're smarter than them? I'll tell you what, I'm probably as good a math student as they are because I was very good in math and I can add things up. I can work equations. And that does not equate. That does not compute, as the guy said on the 
it really doesn't compute, as Robbie the Robot said on Lost in Space. <clears throat> All right. Now, where was I? Galatians, second chapter. I, you know, I prayed over this. I'm fixing to say some stuff here that it may be next week when I say it, but I pray over this, and I, the more I study, the more I study tenses and moods and voices, I'm going, Lord, we don't want nothing about this. Well, it just scares the life out of me. I sat on my couch last night and said, Lord, I don't know what to do with this. I know you're not female, and preachers are saying that you are. By just simply ignoring the tense and ignoring the gender. You can't ignore the gender. If you change one gender in the Word of God, how am I going to know the gender? I'll show you how. You want to come to me? I'll show you how to look up the words. Look up the genders. You change the gender and you've changed the Word of God. You change the tense. I've had people come here and say, well, we don't have any sin after we're saved. Well, then what's that inner man and that outer man wrestling about? And why is Paul said, oh, wicked, oh, he says, I'm a wicked man. He said, and he said, it's sin that dwelleth in me. That word dwelleth comes from the word oikos, meaning house or family. He said, it's living in me. Things that I would do, I do not. And the things I would not do, I find myself doing. It's no more I that do it, but sin that lives in me. He said that as a believer. And that's what we got to wrestle and fight with. And when we wrestle with it and we start standing for truth, people will crucify us and we will resurrect daily in Christ because we got to die daily, don't we? The more I study this, I'm really concluding this. Look here in Galatians, the second chapter. Verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If he lives in me, he has to be resurrected in me, doesn't he? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, by doing righteousness, then Christ, then he died in vain for no reason. Now, if you'll notice, when he says, I am crucified, I am crucified, when it's translated, it's translated indicative. And that is past tense. Well, how in the world do you think the translators, this is something they got right. How do you think they got am out of being past tense? Well, in the aorist indicative, when you have a past tense verb, it can mean it started in the past. It started in the past. An aorist indicative means it always started in the past. Started in past. And here's the action. Am. Am crucified or crucified. But remember, in aorist indicative verbs, you've got, you've got constitutive. And you have ingressive. And you have consumative. Now, consumative means to consume. That means when the action started, it was consumed right there. Boom! It was one time. But that can be an aorist indicative. And ingressive is like an ingress in real estate. I've said this before. When you buy a piece of property that's landlocked, that means it's blocked from getting to it. And you're in Tennessee, and you own some land. Here's the road, and you got Jack Smith lives here, and John Jones, and 
Bill Williams lives here. And you own a piece of land back here. They have to give you an ingress. That's the law in Tennessee to move into it. You have to be given. Somebody's got to. The guy in front of you has got to build. You, you can build a road, but they've got to give you an ingress. That means to move into. Well, ingressive, arist indicative, means the movement started in the past. A constative means it's continual and constant. Constant. It's real difficult to find the difference between an ingressive and a constative because the movement of the ingressive starts. How are you going to tell the difference? And which one an arist tense is? Well, you tell the difference by the context of Scripture. Context or syntax. Syntax comes from S-Y-N. S-Y-N. And we get the word synthesize. Synthesize and taxis, which is a Greek word, means to synthesize the orderly arrangement we get the word tactical from taxis. And a tactical movement is forward march, to the rear march. It's an exact movement. There has to be a context of this. And when Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, yet the original text says, I have been. How many times are we crucified? Luke 9, 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. <clears throat> Therefore, we not only have been crucified with Christ, you can tell that that is a constative and it's never ending until the day you die. Isn't that true? So we have to die daily, Paul said, didn't he? Have to die daily. Well, if we die daily... Where does this resurrection come in? Anastasis. What would you call dying daily, Jim? Well, well, <clears throat> you go out and tell somebody, you get in a, not an argument, get in a conversation with somebody at the grocery store, somebody at the laundromat, and you say, well, I go to this church. People come here that have been questioned about, Philip was questioned about why he come here the other day. He said, well, I've come here because of uh, this preacher, and I saw him, I heard about him, and I moved here from Kansas so I can be a part of this ministry. Well, why did you move all the way here? And he begins to talk about predestination and Christmas. They go, well, I have to go somewhere else. And they begin to crucify you in a sense because they don't like what you're saying, and they start separating from you. And when this happens... That's an everyday resurrection, isn't it? It's not one time in the past like Hymenaeus and Philetus. It's not the one time resurrection of Jesus. But what Paul is saying, he's saying, I am crucified. My crucifixion is with Christ outside of time in eternity. I am constantly crucified. I am with Christ, therefore I'm being resurrected. I believe the resurrection of Christ is coupled with our resurrection daily. I got something to say here in Acts 2. And I'm out of time about. Do I have any time? Go Acts 2 real quick. I'll come back to this. I'm going to stay in this subject. Do you realize that what we've been preaching about maturing in Christ has to do with the resurrection in us daily because when we've been predestined to conform to His image, likeness, what would Jesus like? Well, He took a cross. He told the truth, was condemned for it, took a cross and was crucified on Calvary and resurrected. We're going to be in the likeness of Christ's resurrection, aren't we? We're going to... You say, Jim, I'm not to that place yet where I want to be crucified, where I want to stand up to my family and my friends and to my business associates. You don't have to beat people up. Just take a stand for truth. Do like my son Eric does. They'll come to Eric at work. He works at Lowe's, and they'll say, you're going to come to the Christmas party and back? 
You'll say, you know I don't do that. I told you last year, if you want to know about it, I'll tell you about it. That's what I tell people. I don't beat them up. Do you want to know about it? I'll tell you. Sometimes I'll just make a comment. Somebody say, how are you doing today? Well, I'm still... Same thing as yesterday. I sat down at the grocery store one day. Same thing as yesterday. I'll do the same thing tomorrow, and then I'll do the same thing the day after that, next week, next year, and then I'll die one day and go be with the Lord all of a sudden. Sometimes I just take real quick ways to go, boom, got you. <laughs> and they'll get real quiet real quick, and I don't say anything else because I know they don't want to hear it. I don't always, I'm not that always that scheming. I'll do that once in a while. I say something, I don't try to beat people up with the word. I don't go out and try to beat them up with predestination and the ball bat of Christmas. Don't do that. I'll just say I don't celebrate that. I'll just quit because it's uh, something I learned about it. If they don't say nothing, you don't tell them what you learned. They'll say, well, why? If they say, why? Well, say, you really want to hear it? I'll tell you why. Don't beat people up. The elect will want to hear, and the non-elect won't. Will they? We're not looking for goats to beat up. We're looking for sheep. They've been chosen before the foundation of the world, haven't they? They're our brothers and sisters. Am I out by now, Mike? One minute. We're going to read this next week. Look here. And I'm going to explain it next week, but I'm going to read it right now and let you ponder over it. In verse 31 of Acts 2, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. That word resurrection is anastasis. Is this talking about Jesus resurrecting from the tomb or is it talking about Christ resurrecting in us? Now see, I've heard preachers preach this. This is the resurrection of Jesus that's preaching, Peter's preaching from the tomb. No, it can't be because of the gender of the word resurrection. He's not female, is he? No part of him except his body, spiritually, the church. And who is pre isn't the church being organized here in Acts 2? Isn't it the first message going out to the world to the church. I'll, I'll address this next week. Okay? I saw some things in this. I went, whoa. And then, I'll just go ahead and say this. That his soul was not left in Hades. Neither his flesh did see corruption. I'll leave you something to think about. What is the flesh of Christ? Huh? It's the flesh is the bread, the bread's the body, the body's the church. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. My flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. See, you got the context, the definitions are the same wherever you go. The context may be different. I've got so many more things to say on this. We'll stand this Easter thing for a while along with the fact that you have to be maturing to do this. To resurrect in Christ, first of all, you've got to die daily. And the only way you'll do that is you have been matured in Christ. Teleotes, right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth, for the message. Lord, God, I pray you let me see this. It's, you're so magnificent, we begin to drown, and your word is just overwhelming. God, we pray for the elect here that they'll mature, they'll grow up, they'll learn to die daily. Lead us to your elect family. Teach us how we ought to live with one another. 
open up doors for the ministry. We'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.